So, uh, just like we have our kind of uh, one-dimensional constitutive law that says that stress is E times strain, we also have the generalized Hooke's law. Now you'll notice, you know, typically when we talk about stress, or maybe I should use S, it's a tensor, right? So it's a three by three. But what else do we know about it? <clears throat> the stress tensor? There's nine components there, but are they all unique? It's symmetric, right? So there's only six unique components. Okay? So to avoid having to write a tensor equation, which is a little more complicated, we can write this, we can exploit the fact that it's symmetric, and we can write this in a vector form. And so you notice here, I've written these differently, that they have vectors. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to exploit the symmetry, and I'm going to write them only in terms of their unique components. So I'm going to say that the stress, <laughs> or vector now, is equal to, and the order matters here, OK? I'm going to write the volumetric components first. So S11, S22, S33. And then we're going to write S12, S13, S23. And it would be the same thing for the strain vector, OK? Because it's also symmetric. <clears throat> so if I'm writing this in a vector form now, <coughs> we have six unique strain components. Two, two. This is two, one, two, two, one, three, two, two, three. Okay? In order for this equation to be valid, what what is the shape of C then? It's a six by six. So how many components? 36. So just like if in one dimension, this is my constituent model, right? I need one parameter to characterize it. If I have a fully anisotropic material, at least according to this equation, knowing nothing else, that means I have 36 material properties, 36 things that populate that C matrix. <coughs> now, thankfully, it turns out through you can make some energy arguments uh, and, and exploit the symmetry of the stress and strain tensor, and you can reduce it down to actually 21. So there's only, for, for a material that has no planes of symmetry whatsoever, there's 21 constants in that C matrix that are unique. 21 unique constants. So what that means is I have to go to the laboratory to characterize my material. I have to go to the laboratory and do 21 different experiments. That's what you're going to do in lab next week. Not, not really. It's very, very rare that a material doesn't have any planes of symmetry whatsoever. Okay. And so it turns out if the material has an infinite number of planes of symmetry, we can reduce it all the way down to two constants. Okay. If you have a material that's, say, transversely isotropic, meaning uh, meaning it has a plane of, like, like this tabletop actually would probably be a good example. 
that if I if I have this tabletop and I took it off the table, obviously took it off its supports, if I pull it in this direction, it's roughly going to have the same strength. If I pull it in that direction, it's roughly going to have the same stiffness. But if I push on it or pull on it in this direction, it's going to be a different. It's going to be weaker. That would be a transversely isotropic material. And that this type of material would have a five independent constants. So you'd have to do five experiments to characterize it. Okay? So I wanted to let you know that. <clears throat> but in this class, we're just going to deal with isotropic materials. Okay? So that's what it looks like for an isotropic material. So it's populated, lots of zeros in there. But if you look what's in there, it's just you can populate with E and nu. Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, just two parameters. Okay. <clears throat> we can also write it more compactly. So going back to our tensor notation or our matrix notation, we can write it like this. So where we use K is the bulk modulus times the volumetric strain, right? So remember what I said. The bulk modulus times the volumetric strain, just using our equation for the definition of the bulk modulus, gives you the mean stress, right? The diagonal component of the stress tensor. So then if you m multiply that by the identity matrix and then add that to 2 mu uh, and 2 g, g is the shear modulus, uh, times the full strain tensor minus the volumetric strain, or the average of the volumetric strain. Okay. Uh, anyway, these two equations are the same. And I think oh, I went off the screen there. Hey. Ah. OK, so I'm just going to point out that if you look at this equation, I have a term multiplying i, and I have a, you know, 2g times this multiplies i. So if I rearrange that equation, then I would get basically k minus 2 thirds g times the volumetric strain times i minus uh, plus 2g epsilon, uh, where these are tensors. S and, and uh, epsilon are tensors. And then we can just redefine this guy as lambda, and this is called Lemay's constant. Okay, so these are, we've, you know, we've talked about Poisson ratio, bulk modulus, Young's modulus. They have sort of very physical, very physical meanings, right? You can think of them in terms of an experiment, right? Lemay's constant is not so much. So we just typically define it like this. Okay. Um, 